path or the way the reason I'm doing that is because when we put these on the Prairie Reconstruction Initiative website, we want to do them in the four modules just because it's a little bit easier to consume the information and also a little bit easier for us to caption everything. So that's why I'm doing what I'm doing. So for those wondering, yes, there will be recordings available of all four modules. They'll be on the Prairie Reconstruction Initiative Field Days website, and I think uh, one of our Field Days team will put that into the chat so you can see where. It will not be um, instantaneous or immediate. We are um, a small <laughs> group of people who all have other jobs in addition to being part of this team. And so one of our challenges, but it's a good challenge for us to work on, is making these videos um, and recordings accessible. So we'll be working on that behind the scenes. So just give us a little bit of time and uh, we'll get it up there. The other thing is you can know when that happens or be actively involved with the Prairie Reconstruction Initiative by signing up to be part of our team. And I think uh, Becky is gonna put into the chat how you can get our newsletter and our information. You can also get updates about trainings like this by going to our ecological assistance page on the DNR. And I'm just going to pull that page up so that you can see where it is. It's hard to type and talk, I've discovered. <laughs> it's, a real, it's a real challenge. Oh, my goodness. I'll put it into the chat, but I'll also share my screen here so that way you can see it. So if you scroll down on this e ecological assistance page and you type in your email, now you can see my emails, but if you type in your email and hit submit, you can subscribe to our ecological trainings list, which gives you updates about trainings like this. It'll also give you updates about the Minnesota DNR's Prairie Pod and all kinds of other ways that you can get information about ecology, which is nice, it's a nice thing. And before we get started, we are, I promise it's gonna happen, but we talked about a bunch of resources yesterday uh, that we mentioned. And so help me out, panel, if I say any of these wrong or I miss them. Craig had mentioned Temple Grandin's book of humane livestock handling. And then we talked about Gwen, in addition to owning 2.7 acres and managing those, <laughs> she is also the author of Minnesota Makoche, The Land of the Dakota. And then coming soon, she's writing another book called The Dakota in Minnesota. And um, so you can check both of those out. Um, I believe Minnesota Makoche is available through the historical, the Minnesota Historical Society. Um, you can also get it at other places that you buy books. We won't list them by name, <laughs> but, but lots of other places. And then for those of you who don't know, in addition to Gwen being a teacher to all of us, she is also Minnesota's first indigenous poet laureate and she has a book of poetry called Follow the Blackbirds and another one coming. So we have a, a, a lot to learn and Gwen is just an incredible teacher and these are ways that you can have access to her teachings without having to bug her on the phone. <laughs> and be like, Gwen, I have a question for you. She might have already answered it in these books. <laughs> so that might be something that you can do. And then a uh, final plug, uh, Molly, you're going to be giving a talk at the Wildlife Society uh, meeting next week. Do you want to just talk a I little am. bit about that talk? <laughs> I'm going to be um, talking about our results from our humane handling audit that we've been doing the last couple of years during our bison handling day. And we're going to be comparing our facilities at Miniopa and Blue Mounds. And that'll be at the Wildlife Society meeting um, in Brainerd next week. So if anyone's interested, I can give you a link to that website too. And that's in per an in-person meeting, I should specify, so. Wonderful. And then while y'all are watching this next video, in the background, I'm going to be posting links to those resources that I just mentioned, unless my PRI team does it before me, which is possible. So <laughs> that way we'll just be working in the background a little bit. And then we're going to use the Padlet again. You can also absolutely use the chat if you have questions. The important way to engage here is all of these folks are here. They have knowledge to share. They have lessons learned. And so we want you to take advantage of that time with them and ask the questions that you that you want to ask. So whether you use the Padlet or you use the chat, doesn't matter. If you raise your hand, you want to say it out loud. That's okay too. Like we'll accept any and all questions. 
for the most part. Okay, are we are we ready to roll? Uh, PR team, did I miss anything? I think you got it. All right, it's always good to check because sometimes I forget stuff. It happens. I forgot, panelists. You don't have to have your camera on right now because we're going to watch a video. But you did so great, and it was nice to see your faces. <laughs> All right, give me just a second here while I share my screen. And then, Becky, I'll make sure that we've got sound for this video. Ooh. Hang on, it's opening on a different screen. Okay. My hope for Miniopa is sounds. that more people will love prairie because they love bison. And I think of bison as like the gateway. They're like, oh, let's go see the bison. And then they're like, wow, there's flowers out here. This is a cool open area. So like someone who's never stepped foot in a prairie can drive through and see the bison and maybe take away a little bit of appreciation for the prairie. It was my favorite park before the bison. It was the little gem park of mine that nobody knew about. Now everybody knows about it, <laughs> but it's still special because every time I come out, there's a surprise. Like I'll be like, oh, I'm seeing gentian here where I've never seen it before. Or I forget there's bison and I drive around the corner and I'm like, oh, there's bison. <laughs> like, like you just forget. And so, it's just always something cool. Like during COVID, I drove out here and there was an American bittern right in the wetland on the road and my son got to see it and he calls it the mystery bird. And it was like, just so special. Like you can just really experience the prairie out here. For us as Dakota people, everything on this earth is related in some way. And environmentalists tell us that have been trying to tell us that for generations. But as Dakota people, we understood that at an integral cellular level, that what we do affects the plants around us, affects the water, affects the animals and the birds. And so out of that kind of respect for this earth, which we call Ina, and that's our word for mother. That means that everything on this planet, everything on this earth is our relative. We are all related. We cannot live without one another. And so our responsibility is to be good relatives to this place, to this earth, to our mother, and to treat every living thing on it as if it's our relative. One of the most impressive changes that we've observed since this project began is the restoration of the prairie plants and to be able to see them thriving and more and more of those plants are coming up naturally. This, this isn't a cultivated space at all. This is a natural space that's been made by the bison as they walk through and by the birds that have come back, um, by the animals that are now interacting. It's just this great cooperative system that the, the bison have helped regenerate. We definitely do notice that they have an impact on some of our woody vegetation thickets, such as our sumac thickets, in that they're, they're, they can be destructive to the sumac thickets when that herd moves through those, breaking them down, eating them. Um, I think the thing that I was surprised by the most is, especially in the winter time, the amount of time that the bison spend browsing on woody vegetation, whether that's oak leaves, whether that's oaks, whether that's dogwoods, willows, they spend a lot of time browsing on those. And uh, the hope is that as they continue to do that, they will eventually affect those, those woody vegetation species that are not necessarily bad, but that are encroaching into our prairie location. Um, and uh, we'll see that 
as time goes on here, whether that, that is having the effect or not. But uh, they definitely have their locations that they enjoy the most. And um, in those locations, we see wallows that develop, which open up an opportunity for insects, open up an opportunity for species that take advantage of disturbance like that. Um, so it's, it's, it's in progress right now. The most exciting was probably a cattle egret that showed up and sat on the bison and has come back multiple years now, uh, which was kind of cool because, you you know, they're cattle egret, that's what they do. But it was just fun to see them with the more natural bison. Um, from, from a plant perspective, we've been seeing more, um, you know, we had it out there and we knew they were out there, but you just wouldn't see large numbers of like prairie violet or prairie blue-eyed grass, longleaf bluets, like those short forbs that, you know, sometimes they get lost in a sea of grass. Now you will see quite a few of those out there and they're more obvious. Um, and the botanist doing our surveys has said she's also been seeing more like orchid type and wetland plants. And that's probably more to do with the change in our climate rather than the bison, but they're, they're getting expressed as well. And as a biologist, it's just really rewarding to bring back a missing piece of that puzzle. Um, and I always joke that I'm going to bring burrowing owls back next because <laughs> they're my favorite, but it's just great. Um, you know, we've had a badger reintroduction out here. We've we're just trying to get those missing pieces back and fill in that puzzle as much as we can, which we know we can never complete, but we can do our best. And so it feels really good. I would say that you should go on to Google Maps, who did a drive through of the bison range with um, Google Street View in 2015. And you should look at all the images that were taken through that drive through and look at it then compared to what it is now and how much progress has been made, how many good things have happened, and use that as your motivation to continue to do those good things in the future and understand that you are absolutely a gateway park for, for understanding the bison, for having their first camping experience, for understanding resource management, um, you are directly Im impacting the next generation of conservationists, resource managers, and, and just the general public. That's, that's what I embrace that opportunity. If I were to leave Miniopa and had an opportunity to talk to the next manager, the piece of advice that I would leave with them is even though the resource management side takes a lot of time and a lot of effort, and we do a lot of it on the hottest, most humid days of the year, to not lose focus of that and to not lose sight of it. It is amazing how quickly everything can slide backwards, but it takes so much work to gain it back and to move it forward. We certainly do have a priority to the visitors of our park and the people that come here and ensuring that they have a positive experience. But I do think that the resource management is a big part of why we're here and, and a very important piece of maintaining Miniopa for future generations and ensuring that this is still here for others to enjoy. We have a lot of staff members that have poured their hearts and souls into this, this area in getting it to be what it is today. And we want to honor that and continue to progress it and, and move it forward. You got to keep on top of the prairie. The prairie is something to love, but you talk to anybody that has prairie and it's an ongoing thing. And as soon as you relax and think that you are ahead of the game or think that you got it accomplished, you've just lost five years. Because if you're not doing the prescribed burns and if you're not getting those bison to move around, you're gonna go backwards faster, a lot faster than you realize. The, the amount of change that you're going to make going that way is gonna be very slow. But if, once you stop, the amount of change going backwards is just gonna be so much quicker. You can make a bison do anything it wants to do. <laughs> um, no, seriously though, I'd say just 
the exciting thing about this park is there's always new surprises. And so just be open to change and open to just learning new things. I mean, the whole reintroduction here has taught me so much just from planning to policy making to actually being a land manager. So I think just being open to that is going to be what makes you successful. I would say that it if you can have a naturalist on staff at the park, it's really valuable thing to do. I mean, I know you need to do your basic maintenance, repair the road, cut up trees that have fallen, clean the bathrooms. But I mean, the real purpose of, of a park is to educate people. And <clears throat> without a naturalist reaching out and explaining things, I think you're losing a lot. Just keep educating the people because I have seen a lot of people come through here didn't know anything about the prairie and thought this was really neat. They only thought state parks were up in the woods and the lakes. And then they were gonna to go to Blue Mound because that was fun too. So I think Minnesota needs to recognize that there's also prairies as well as the lakes and the trees. Since I'm a prairie girl anyway. <laughs> At first I thought this was kind of a junky park when it came online at, in 1970s. But I didn't know about those big oak trees. And those oak trees are pretty marvelous. And the rocks are just really kind of fun. Every time you turn around, there's some new weird thing that pops up. And so it's a great place to walk. And being out in the environment in nature is just good for us. That's, that's what I say anyway. I used to say go to yoga. Now I say go take a walk that's a good thing to do. What we have here is a treasure. And anytime we value something, we treasure it, we also have an obligation to care for it in the most responsible and loving way. Um, in Dakota, the word to cherish kingdom. Um, and we we cherish this place the stewards of this park of this bison range cherish this place as well and for those people coming after us who will be the caretakers of this place i would just say to remember to remember that this has been a cherished place beyond memory. always like to give it a beat after after Gwen just because I like her words to sink in for all of us. All right, I can get my panelists back up and ready to go. Going to share the questions. We have a couple of questions still in here from last time. So this is your, you know, this last module we really focused on what advice would you give to future managers or future stewards of this land. And so you heard a lot of different perspectives there. You heard a perspective from the Friends of Miniopa group. You heard perspectives from Bison Ambassadors. You heard um, Gwen's perspective. You heard Park Manager perspective. You heard Naturalist perspective. And so this is really, <laughs> and you notice they weren't, nobody gave the same advice, which I actually think is really good because everybody's, you know, coming at it from a slightly different angle. And if we can combine those perspectives, think of how much better we're going to be as stewards and, you know, temporary <laughs> managers of this land. So not to get too heavy, but I just think that's that's neat that we didn't know what answers to expect when we were asking these questions. But when we were putting the video together, I thought it was interesting that everybody had a slightly, slightly different take on what their nugget of advice would be. So we are going to start with some of the questions that we didn't get to from last time but as you're reflecting on that this is really your opportunity to ask all of these amazing people you know about mistakes they made lessons learned um 
managing a prairie with federally listed species, fire, free range bison that are there all the time, you know, how and a finite land base. How how do you do this? And as you're hearing, a lot of different partners with different perspectives about how those bison are viewed. And so that obviously needs to translate then into how we honor them as relatives and how we move through this park as stewards. So that's a long speech to basically say, y'all better have some questions for us. <laughs> okay, we're gonna start with um, herd size. Jess, do you wanna give voice to your question right here? We'll talk a little bit about the herd size. We did touch on it a little bit yesterday, but we might have some more things we wanna to add today. Yeah, yeah. So, you know, how did how did you determine your initial herd size? And then are there any plans to maybe change that herd size in the future, increase or decrease? And if so, like, have you talked about what would be those things that would trigger that change in herd size? I can take this one. Um, so we did a conservation grazing plan before we um, as we were the first year before we brought them in. We did forage clippings uh, that we used to determine how much forage was out there available to the bison. And we mostly just focused on grass forage because we knew that's 90% of what they ate. Um, and so we used that to determine kind of a baseline. And we had one year of drought and one year really wet when we did those forage clippings. So we didn't quite have what we would consider a normal year, which I guess with climate change, we don't have normal anymore. So um, we based it on that, and then just this past year, we rewrote that conservation grazing plan because now we've had them there enough years. We're knowing what we're seeing out there. We have a bigger herd, and we wanted to see kind of like how we were doing. So we we used that conservation grazing plan, and we determined like how many animal units um, and I can share that with folks. I'm not going to get like into the details of it because it if you haven't done grazing stuff before, it can be kind of confusing, but I can, I'm happy to share that conservation grazing plan um, if people want it. So then once we had that animal unit number, um, you know, that roughly relates to how many um, cow-calf pairs or a bull and things like that. And we had an estimate like, um, you know, a cow-calf pair when the calf was just born would be one animal unit. So, um, one thing we learned uh, after a couple of years, we were able to get a scale at Miniopa, and that helped us really refine, like, because we were estimating with cow-calf pairs, we didn't have weights, and it actually was a bit different. Once we got the scale, uh, it changed the quote-unquote number of animals you could have uh, versus the estimation. So um, we're still kind of learning and fine-tuning, and now we've had two years of drought out there and we're, we were with our, our baby boom, I guess I'll call it last year of calves. Um, we, we know we have too many breeding females out there right now. So this year we got rid of several breeding females and we're just trying to get rid of um, a few more for next year to get that herd size down, especially you know not knowing if we'll go into a drought this year. Um, so we kind of, you know, base it on both the, the vegetation surveys we're doing and just time out there, how the range is looking. And then, um, you know, based on that cow calf pair number, we kind of have a rough number of animals around those animal units. So, um, yeah, that's kind of the general answer, but if you want details, I can share that grazing plan with folks. And yesterday you mentioned a little bit too that the, we are limited by the finite amount of land uh, that Miniopa has. Maybe, um, Craig, do you want to talk a little bit about how the, I don't know how to put this, so I'm probably not going to put this exactly the right way, but that there's a, a footprint that Miniopa State Park um, that you can acquire lands within that statutory footprint, basically, so that we are even just talk a little bit about how that works with the state park system. Sure. So state parks have uh, two boundaries, essentially. Uh, the first is their owned boundary, which is property that the 
the state of Minnesota actually owns. And it's the property that the public can use within the state park. And then the state park, all, the second boundary is our statutory boundary. And the statutory boundary is, is another boundary and land that we don't own, land that the state doesn't own that falls within the statutory boundary. The state has the has an opportunity to purchase that if it were to ever come for sale in the future. Doesn't mean that we have the rights to that land. It just means that we are able to make an offer just like anybody else would be able to make an offer on that property. If it's property that's outside of the statutory boundary and it comes for sale and we have an interest in it, um, then it has to go through a legislative process to be added to the state's the state park statutory boundary before a purchase can be made. So. Um, probably pretty defined right now i would say the the herd at miniopa without an opportunity to expand but where we're getting the the hay for winter feeding is some property that we just um acquired reacquired um to the west of of the bison range and realistically there's not a there's not many landowners in between that property and where the bison are right now Future, there there could be a possibility to connect that and and expand the herd size, but for right now, the foreseeable future, I think this is what it is. Thanks for that. I think that was helpful. We're gonna shift gears just a little bit and talk about monitoring. There are two questions about monitoring that are in here, so we'll have Tom Skilling ask his question. First, and then I think this one from yesterday, this animal populations one, is also talking about, you know, what do you monitor and how do you make some choices? So, Tom, if you want to go ahead and start with this one. Okay, yes, I was just wondering on the vegetation monitoring, how or, or do you use that data to inform management? Uh, things like, is there hard triggers where if you find something, it you automatically have some management response, or is it more of an evaluation and then a move forward? And then also curious if uh, the management on remnants versus reconstructions and and your and your inventory or or monitoring data, if if the response is the same on the on the two different remnant versus reconstruction. Molly, let's start with you. Go for it. Okay, so um, the monitoring data, like I said, we are using the grassland monitoring team protocol, and that protocol was specifically designed for remnants. Um, and so, and we had actually started that monitoring before we even thought about putting bison at Miniopa. Um, so we kind of had those transects set already. And then I realized we we're getting bison and it was like, whoa, what do we, you know, we got to make more transects and kind of switch them. So, um, so we did add some transects to the um, reconstruction area. Although, like I said, this protocol was designed for remnants, um, not for reconstructions. Um, so it it's not, I maybe wouldn't have chosen this protocol necessarily had I known we were getting bison, uh, but it was what we already had data for and we were already invested in it. So uh, we do have some issues with trying to pull out the effects that are coming from bison. Are they coming from the hydrology that has changed significantly out there in the past 15 years? Or is it because we're doing all these other management things um, you know, we're cutting a lot of trees, we're um, forestry mowing, and now we're spraying. And so we're also trying to track where we're doing all those things. And to tease it apart uh, is very difficult. Um, so I can't say exactly like this, this is due to the bison. You know, we can say we have this vegetation change, but we can't say it's due to the bison or it's due to hydrology. Uh, we can more just say, you know, this is the vegetation change we're seeing out there. So um, I think I suspect the hydrology is playing the biggest role out there right now. So because we're just seeing upland areas turn to wetland um, with our we just have more increased larger rains. And there's a lot of seeps that run off that hill down into that terrace. And um, 
And then I think the action of the bison in the wetlands kind of packing it down makes it hold water for even longer. So um, I don't know, did I answer your question that way? It's, I guess my answer is it's more complicated than I would was hoping it would be. Yes, no, I, I thank you for that. I, I, uh, I understand the complexity thing because I, I had the same issue. <laughs> yeah. So yeah, you can see I, here the dots are where the original, where our transects were. And um, this area number eight, eight and eight F, I pulled that out because um, eight F was farmed. Um, so then we added separate transects there. We treated that as a, even though, um, and that's the favorite bison area with the cool season grasses, so. Which one is the bison favorite? It both eight and yeah, half they, or... yeah, they kind of like that whole big area there. Yeah. Okay. Just curious about that. Um, and then you probably covered it, but what types of monitoring are you doing out there? That was okay, the other question. yeah, other than vegetation, um, we're not doing a whole lot. We're doing some pretty basic bee and um, kind of odonate and lepidoptera surveys. Um, right now, it's more focused on we don't even have kind of a good list of knowing what is out there. Um, so it's not really a population related survey. It's more of a um, just trying to even figure out what is out there. Um, and I mentioned with the rusty patch, like now that we know that's out there, what parts of the park is it using will be our next um, thing. And so I'd say at Blue Mounds, we have much better um, data that we've done a lot of bird surveys and now we're doing pollinator surveys um, near the range and in the range. So I guess at Miniopa we haven't focused more specifically on the monitoring of the, you know, individual populations. I would love to, if, if anyone has a grad student, send them my way. <laughs> And last monitoring question is this one. Well, maybe not the last, but for this set right here. Um, can you just go back over a little bit about what monitoring was done with the vegetation specifically before bison and now with bison? Yeah, so we had, because this vegetation monitoring was on a three year um, cycle, we had one year prior to the bison coming and then I realized they were coming. And so we did another year um, where we moved some of the transects because some of them were like halfway in the fence and halfway out. And so, and now we have um, two more cycles with that three year rotation. Um, and we got, <laughs> our data this year was not great um, because of the drought. Um, so I think we're gonna redo it next year. Um, because some of the, and also some of the areas were mowed. Um, and, but we are seeing, we, we do think we have two new state listed plant species um, that haven't been found in this county before. So we're seeing a lot of like little rock outcrop um, or, you know, bare ground, short prairie kind of specialist species. Um, so that's kind of exciting. Um, so yeah, I guess we don't have like the big data analysis yet, so I don't have any super exciting results, but we're kind of, we're getting there. We're getting really close to having the data we need to kind of do that big analysis. So yeah, there's some of the transects and you can see there's a lot of rockiness and bare ground and it's almost like an outcrop system in some places. So you get some really kind of weird rock outcrop plants. Nice. We're going to pivot just a little bit. Don't worry, Brett. I'm going to ask your question after I ask this question. Um, Gwen, I'm just curious. So in the video, you talked about this being a cherished place and that we should remember that. And so one of the questions, well, it's a two-parter, two of course. Of course. <laughs> it's a two-parter question is that how do we um, honor that from a management perspective? And then secondly, how do we honor that from a, a visitor perspective, like a visitor to the park? Yeah, 
You already do that from a park perspective, from a management perspective. And I think it's evident in just the conversation we've had answering these questions. Um, tejinde, tejinda um, means to hold something close, to cherish and um, There you are, you have a personal relationship with this, this land and this landscape and these plants. Um, even though it's your job to be responsible for the management of this place, it's not just a job. Um, you're, you're invested, um, I think, and it's obvious from the way you talk about your connections to, to this place, invested in its protection, invested in its um, health, invested in its future. So I think that's one aspect of, of honoring this place. And um, from a visitor perspective, also from from the the video, we know that like friends of um, Miniopa love this place and cherish it and honor it. And um, the volunteers who are there every year to tell the story of this place. So not everyone is going to honor it. That's just the way it is. But the people who do um, are are the keepers, the keepers of this place, and help us remember what's so important about it. You, I can hear it in your voices, all of you, the way you talk about this space. Glenn, you're getting me choked up, trying to <laughs> facilitate a meeting here. <laughs> Be all emotional, <laughs> but but it is a good point that by caring for it and doing the work that we do and being thoughtful about the choices that we're making. And I joked earlier that Craig fretted a lot, but I mean even that shows that he cares, right? Like, he, and you all do, just like Gwen's saying. But there's concern there because we want it to go well and we want to make good choices. But it's always hard, right? <laughs> Hindsight's twenty twenty, so it's always hard to know was that the right choice until maybe a little bit later. So I just appreciate this group's constant diligence in evaluating your choices and making sure that if we made a mistake, we correct it and we make different choices moving forward to the benefit of the prairie and the bison and everything in between, right? Sounds beautiful, Gwen. Um, OK, let's shift back a little bit to Buckthorn. Everybody, it's kind of a hard pivot to Buckthorn. But uh, Brett, do you want to give voice to your question here? Yeah, I was just curious with the burning that you did in the oak savannas there, you know, I guess what was your timing on your burns? How many have you done? And have you seen any decrease in the Buckthorn in those areas? How about I start with this one and then Scott can maybe talk about the buckthorn work that the volunteers have been doing. Um, so when we first started with the buckthorn, we had a CCM crew come in with brush saws and cut kind of right under our biggest trees. And then um, because we the fire just wouldn't go through, it was too thick. There wasn't it wasn't going to carry. Um, and so then we kind of got to the point where we could start burning through it. Um, and then that was like, that's the key is like, once you can start getting fire back into that system, um, then you can start, I feel like moving the needle and you may have to go back in and cut again. Um, and we were burning pretty late season, like in, you can see there, the plum is in bloom. Um, I think that was in May, maybe it says on this photo what your, what day it was, but 
Um, so we were trying to do it when things are already starting to leaf out and it's what we consider the growing season to kind of hurt it. Um, and we also burned in fall as well in the different units. Um, we would mix it up if we burned it in spring one year, we'd burn it in the fall, you know, the next time on the rotation. So, um, I do think you can control buckthorn with fire, but probably maybe not with just fire, unless you're on a super aggressive uh, fire regime. But uh, with the combination of at another park, we're doing goat grazing and we're seeing good results with that, where the goats will graze the buckthorn and that gets to the point where you can get fire back in there. And then once you can get that fire to carry, um, then you can really start making a difference, it seems like. Scott, do you want to talk about the volunteer group? Yeah, I just want to say I agree with Molly. I think that you're going to have to do a combination of fire cutting. And I mean, it would be great to have goats at Miniopa because I think we have cut a lot of buckthorn. And uh, unless you're continuing to keep on top of it, um, it just, really keeps filling back in. We see that um, in our group campground um, around our wetland where we really had a lot of that cut. And if you go back in there, it's starting to look like a mini forest again. And, you know, volunteers have been really great. And I think we really had uh, a lot going with us for our volunteers until COVID. And uh, so it's slowly coming back, um, but that's also, uh, using volunteers um, is a great way to not only um, help with the resource end, but really give people a chance to give something back to the park. I like how you put that, Scott. Give people a chance to give something back. That's really nice. I like it. Okay, we're going to um, shift gears a little bit and talk about state bison herd minnesota cut molly i always get the acronym wrong <laughs> minnesota bison conservation herd i always want to say minnesota conservation bison herd which is I don't, it's just a struggle i don't know why <laughs> so ashley we're gonna start with you um so this question is about or actually whoever asked this question do you want to read it I can do that. Um, so I just asked if you could talk a little bit about <clears throat> future plans for the state conservation bison herd. There was a mention of other sites, state parks that were considered before Miniopa was chosen. Will you look at other state parks, maybe um, tribal lands or, uh, you know, um, other types of lands and will the efforts be through expanding current populations or bringing new sites online? Is there a timeline for it and what kind of barriers um, are you looking at as you try to expand the conservation herd? So really the the biggest barrier that we're facing is is space. Um, like Craig already talked about really our herd size at Miniopa without expanding the area of the park that's fenced in and currently there's not an opportunity to do that um, we really can't increase our herd size so really the way we do this is by bringing on new partners and molly does a lot of work with speaking with future potential partners working with tribal groups to try to see if there's interest to become part of the bison conservation herd um, we've we've talked a couple of times about Dakota County and how they um, have recently joined the bison conservation herd and how we help provide animals from Miniopa, Blue Mounds, Oxbow and the Minnesota Zoo to help establish their herd so really that's kind of how we move forward with expanding it is by bringing on new partners and having new areas to house them. I would just add that um, the way we have done it by adding these smaller partners, I think is really great on the educational side and really getting that voice um, out there about uh, the Minnesota Bison Conservation Herd and what we're trying to do. But I think ideally the next spot would be a much larger area that you could have 200, 250, because 
honestly trying to increase to that 500 level when you're only adding 10, 15, 20 here and there, it's gonna be a long process. And ideally I think that that spot would be an American Indian community. And we should note too that um, some of the tribal communities do have bison right now. So it's not, um, my understanding is they're not necessarily part of the Minnesota bison conservation herd, although we do share, I, or, or they are, or they aren't. Gwen, correct me. There's a lot of head shaking. <laughs> when you're supposed to use the, the icon we talked about yesterday. There, there are some tribal herds right now, but um, most of those are production herds. OK, OK, that helps. Thank you. And so, yeah, there's some logistics there, too, that would need to be worked out. I forget what the rest is that I was going to talk about. I don't remember. Anyway, it'll come to me or, or it won't. Megan. Uh, I just had one thing to add. Yeah, there are other ways to partner with the conservation um, partnership, you know, that people are partners with us, but maybe aren't necessarily um, like Prairie Island does have bison, but they're not part of our herd. Um, but we're working with also the Shakopee tribe. They're going to be getting bison from Prairie Island, I think, or from one of their other um, relatives that you know, we're still working with them and partnering with them, even if they're not necessarily part of our herd. Um, and then other opportunities we're looking for is playing a role in federal conservation because the genetics of this herd are such that they are important on a national level. So, um, you know, these animals don't necessarily have to stay in Minnesota. So we're looking to partner uh, more with the intertribal um, buffalo group that they're always Bison reintroduction is really popular right now, so they're looking for animals, and we always have surplus animals, and a lot of times we have surplus breeding females, which is what you need. So, um, yeah, we are hoping to play a bigger role in bison conservation across the nation and just not in Minnesota. Thank you, Molly. That's what I was trying to say, is that <laughs> there, are, there are tribes right now who do have bison, but they help us out in other ways than necessarily animal exchange. Like I think Scott, you had mentioned in the video that Shakopee Mdewakanton um, helped us out with some of the infrastructure and other things. So there are partnerships that are happening. I was gonna ask a follow-up question to Scott. I'm trying to keep all of my questions straight before I ask the new questions on the screen. Scott, you mentioned that it would be nice to have a parcel of land where you could really have like 250 bison. Just in general, and I know it depends, it's it's not just a straight like acre to animal uh, calculation that we're making. It depends on what forage is there and lots of other things, but how many, and this might be a Molly question too, but how many acres do you need to support that many animals in general, like a rough estimate? I am going to definitely let Molly answer that question. <laughs> <laughs> Call for it, Molly. <laughs> Well, we, we have the opportunity. Yeah, we have 330 <laughs> acres right there out there right now. And I'd say 30 is about the right size amount of bison for that. Um, but that's with soils 18 inches deep, short grass prairie. It is not a productive prairie out there. Craig mentioned Myrie Big Island was being considered uh, as one of the parks. That park could have had way more bison per acre because it's super tall grass prairie, really nice soils, lots of moisture. Um, so you really have to know your site and, and really look at your site to know that exact number. We're also using a 50% utilization. That means that no more than 50% of the grass would be eaten out there. Um, other, you know, for a bison producer, 50% is probably a high number. Um, for a conservation herd, some people go with even less utilization. It just depends kind of what your goals are. So um, keep that in mind too. How much of that grass do you want to remain out there for other things like bird structure and nesting? And, you know, maybe you only want to be eating 30% of that grass. So you have to kind of play that into the equation. 
good, good. Uh, and I just did some quick math. So if you had a site similar to Miniopa, that's about 11 acres of bison. And so if you wanted 250 animals, it's about 2,750 acres. That's assuming that you're using the same utilization strategy and you have the same production levels and shallow soils. So just to give you a rough idea. So if anybody's got a spare 3,000 acres that they just are, <laughs> you know, curious if they can put a bison on, uh, you want to talk to these folks because they have some bison. <laughs> okay, let's talk about badgers. Uh, a couple people are asking questions about um, other species, and including badgers. And so I'm just going to lump those together. So the badger specifically is in the video. You mentioned that a badger reintroduction took place. Are the badgers still there? Do the bison benefit the badgers in any way? And I'm going to add, do the badgers benefit the bison in any way? I'm going to flip that around. And then the second part of that question is this one right here that is talking about, we'll just use the first part. Has there been any discussion about reintroducing other animals back onto the site? I could take the badger one because I was directly involved with that. Um, so the badger reintroduction was a little bit opportunistic. Um, Fort Ridgely State Park is also one of the parks I help manage. And so they have probably the healthiest badger population I've seen in Minnesota there. Uh, we have an active um, den every year with new little badgers being born and they like to go into the historic cemetery and dig in the graves so <laughs> they're naughty badgers um actually it's just because we have a really good 13 line ground squirrel population there and there's this nice mode cemetery full of ground squirrels and the badgers can't help themselves so every couple of years i get a phone call like Molly, the badgers are digging up the historic graves and they're causing trouble and the historical society wants to kill them all. And so I said, OK, let's trap them. And a gal who was my counterpart up in the northwest did studies on badgers. So she came down and taught us how to trap them. And um, after a couple of nights, it took two nights, we caught them and then we just moved them to Miniopa. So it was it wasn't like this huge, big, you know, thing where we monitor them or anything. It was just like, let's move this badger to a place it won't get in trouble. Um, and so we don't really know if they established a, you know, a population. I don't really see badgers out there, um, but it would be hard to see them also with all the brush and sumac and stuff. So but I kind of am hoping for that next phone call because we'll just keep moving badgers from Fort Ridgely to Miniopa as they get in trouble, so. They're also quite secretive. And I think something, um, I'm, I'm gonna add something here about the connection piece. So you, I think Molly, you mentioned it earlier. I can't remember who mentioned it, but about the herons eating the placenta of yeah. the bison. And basically they're, you know, getting rid of that waste so that as you have baby bison you don't just have this this stack up that of afterbirth around the park right and badgers are also nature's recyclers so they do a lot of that work as well burying carcasses and saving them to eat on later and so i think there's all kinds of interactions that we probably don't fully know or understand that are happening um, even if it's not, you know, it's a web of life, right? So even if there's not necessarily a direct line between bison to badger, they're in that web. So I just want, want to make yeah, that point. Another part of that is like with the nutrient cycling, if you think of all these big animals that used to be out there, you know, cycling those nutrients, and then also if that animal died, it would have laid on the prairie and gone back into the ground eventually. So we do try to, if we have an animal that's old and dies, you know, try to just leave it out there on the prairie and decompose and let the coyotes and stuff do their thing um, to try to get back some of those nutrient processes that, you know, are maybe gone or that link is broken, so. That's super neat. Um, let's talk a little bit about the rest of this question. Let me make sure we answered it. 
Uh, there was some discussion at one time about the reintroduction of elk, maybe to the state forest. I don't know where that is or if that's something the state is still trying to work out. I'm not sure about elk. Do you, does anybody know anything about that piece of the question? It's I okay don't have any recent updates on that. I think it's still being worked on. I don't think there's been like a, no, we're not doing it, but um, there's some definite challenges with it, I think, because of some private land and, um, you know, landowner concerns with elk on um, eating other things. So uh, I think it's an awesome project, but I don't really have an update on it. Yeah, and with any of this, it's it's this constant balance, right? Like we got asked this when we did the hole in the mountain field day last year. We're not managing for single species. So even though there are bison at Miniopa and that has its own whole set of logistics and considerations and everything else, you're still managing Miniopa as a prairie, as a state park, <laughs> and with a bison herd on it. And so it's I think Tom's question got at this a little bit earlier. It's always hard when you have these sort of competing resources with that might not always align in their needs, what rises to the top, right? And so I think that was some of his question, like who, <laughs> is there a mechanism that then triggers a certain response? And I think we were basically answering it's complicated, <laughs> which it is complicated. Let's jump a little bit to burn interval and herd size. Muffy, do you want to ask this question? No, you can do it. Thanks. OK. Well, thank you. You gave me that opportunity. All right, so you said you're doing a uh, patch burn on one tenth. I think you said 10 percent per year in the video where I live in Wisconsin. A 10 year rotation won't keep the brush from taking over, so I'm wondering why you're talking about reducing herd size rather than increasing the amount burned per year, or maybe I misunderstood how much is being burnt. Yeah, um, so we would also be doing forestry mowing in our other cutting and foliar spraying of the sumac in between that. So yeah, if you were just strictly burning, you will lose your prairie at burning it only every 10 years. You know, I think you'd want to do it more at five. Um, also burning with the 10%, uh, but in that that unit eight, that's our biggest burn unit, that's 100 acres. Because a lot of that is mostly just um, brome field, we oftentimes will burn that whole thing. So, um, so the 10%, I guess, wouldn't include that, um, if that makes sense. So we would actually be burning on a shorter interval than every 10 years. But we would also be doing the forestry mowing in between as well. And why, just as a quick follow up, so you mentioned this in the video that you were burning more. And then yeah. after consulting with the grazing specialist, you backed off and went to this 10% number. What was the concern there or why was that decision made? Um, because the, the areas we were burning, um, were too big for the bison to stay on that patch for a long time. And um, so, you know, you burn it, it comes up green and the bison are immediately on it and they're wanting it to stay that nice lush green. But if it starts growing, if, especially if it's a wet year, starts growing really fast, they can't keep it short. So the, if you have a, a, a right size patch, they can stay on it for longer because it, they're just keep eating it as it's growing, if that makes sense. So that's why we wanted to make our patch sizes smaller. Now you could you could burn just 10% in the spring and then burn 10% later in the summer and then burn another 10% later in the fall. So um, you know you could you could still get more burned than just 10% as well. So. So it's 10% at a time. Yeah, basically, yeah, that season. that's it's a better way to say it. Yeah. It's not 10% a year, it's 10% within that year of yeah. your spring burn, your summer and your fall burn. Yeah. Ish. And we usually, 
what we have been doing until COVID, you know, we couldn't burn during COVID. And then now with the drought, we did not, we chose not to burn last year. Um, we were typically doing a late spring and then we'd stop during the summer and then we do another kind of early fall burn before the sumac um, turned completely red, so. I'm skipping, I'm sort of saving this question for last because I think it's a nice question to end, to end on, this challenges and opportunities one. So I'm gonna go down here to some of the ones that we didn't um, get to yesterday. Uh, and then I'll just read Amanda's question. I think we did talk about this, but maybe not in super great detail. So Amanda's question is, is the only remnant prairie at Miniopa now in the bison range? You mentioned the people who enjoyed hiking in the prairie, maybe botanizing. Could you elaborate on how you continue to give access to prairie habitats for visitors? And I think we're going to start with Ashley for this one. And then Molly, you can add about the, the prairie types. So we do have another remnant prairie or a, a decent sized remnant prairie outside of the bison range. That remnant prairie is still in need of some restoration. It does have a lot of woody vegetation in it. Um, and working with Molly and, and her team, there are plans to work towards restoration of that area. And we are also working on doing buckthorn management to try to bring some of those opportunities for those folks that had enjoyed the prairie. But as of right now, the nicest prairie is located with inside that bison range. And that's where we had talked about some of the disappointment by some of the visitors um, for losing that access. So we're actively working towards trying to provide those opportunities moving forward with the remnant prairie that still remains. Does anybody have anything else they want to add to that? I'll just say that it gave us the opportunity to realize some other prairie we had out there that maybe we didn't realize how nice it was because it kind of had some buckthorn in it and then Scott worked with his volunteers and cut the buckthorn out and Megan that's when we found a tuberous Indian plantain come up you know that we never knew we had so uh it, it like the bison just kind of snowball they give you all these other opportunities to you know now we're gonna do prairie management over here and oh man we found a state listed plant we didn't know about so it just kind of keeps, you know, keeps us focusing our, our resource efforts, so. No, oh, that's a great point. And I just brought up this picture of the fence here just to, and I know obviously this is, this. I should make the note, this is during construction. This is not when the animals are there. This is not the finished product. So in case somebody's looking at that going, It's wow. an invisible fence. <laughs> yeah, wow, well, how does that keep a big old bison in? Um, this is during construction, but so I'm pulling it up just because you can walk around the range on the outside of it, not within it. And so I think this is just a nice view of that where this this would be inside the range and this is outside of it. And so you can actually walk pretty much. Is it the whole perimeter yep. in a loop pretty much? Yeah. So which gives you a, a lot of opportunity to see the bison, especially if you can't see them from the road that's running through the range in the middle, because sometimes they're hanging out over by the fence. Um, and so that's just a so there is still some access to the prairie that's in the range, um, especially if you're a birder. I mean, no, it's not the same as walking through the 330 acres, but you can still see quite a lot of birds from this edge here. So I just want to make that point. As yeah, well. and the park had a history of people, you know, birding in the same spot every year for 30 years. And so when we were bringing bison in and all of a sudden you're telling park visitors there's 300 acres of this park you can't walk in anymore. That was a little heartburn for some people who were used to using the park in their way and it was really special to them and losing that hiking trail through there. So that was probably the only controversy we had with bringing bison back was that there's now going to be a different way you have to use this 300 acres. Um, but I think, you know, people took it in stride and now they have new ways to use it and have really adapted. So I don't think, you know, we don't really get the complaints or anything. So 
usually just get a complaint when the bison drive is closed, right, Ashley? That we do. <laughs> you know, I should mention that we have done a lot of work on the office side. Um, so that waterfall side of the park as well to develop some smaller prairie plantings. And they're really starting to come around and really starting to show a lot of the color from the Forbes. And we have seen a lot of people stopping. They stop at the office to buy a permit, but then they walk to look at the prairie and to take photos of whatever is in bloom at that time. So there are other opportunities. They're not as big of an area, but there are opportunities if you visit all the other parts of the park and try to find all those nuggets where they're available. And the office is where we found the four rusty patches. So <laughs> that is not surprising because that those um, pollinator plantings that you worked on, Molly, are filled with flowers. And yep. so that is that is not surprising, often in a way that's that's different from a, a prairie site, right? Prairies have flowers, but maybe not so many all in one space. So it's really beautiful. It's actually when we did Miniopa Days last year, and now I feel like Dorothy and Gwen was there, and Scott was there, and Ashley was there. We did, um, that's where I chose to be because I knew that the students would get to see a lot of insect visitors up close and personal, and we wouldn't have to search very far, and they wouldn't have to walk very far. So this, uh, I'm going to pivot to this question about training. And uh, I want to expand that not just to training about bison, but training about Dakota, about Dakota culture, and things that were important to know there as you were working on bringing their relative home. And so, Tom, I didn't even give you the opportunity to ask it. <laughs> I just rolled right over you, but I think it, you'll be fine with it. So what kind of training, if any, did you all take? And we'll probably do a, a round robin of this. Um, so Scott Kadelka, we're going to start with you. Um, tr training. <laughs> <laughs> You're usually the one giving the training, not taking the training. <laughs> so. Um, I guess I don't know if there was any formal training. It was more just, uh, again, I think collaborative effort and uh, utilizing all these partners um, that had knowledge outside of maybe our expertise. What was one of the most, 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 most important things that you learned that you think helped you um, be better at stewarding the site and educating the public at this site? Um, I, I think just uh, listening to other people's voices. And uh, I think the main one was um, when we first brought them over, we were pretty gung-ho that, you know, they were bison, that's the scientific name. And then uh, my interaction with Gwen and then uh, Cheyenne St. John um, at Lower uh, Sioux and other American Indian tribes, understanding that the term buffalo and that meaning to them I think really changed my attitude that um, both of those names can be used interchangeably and you don't have to be a uh, hard case on either one of them. Greg, how about you? Um, prior to getting involved with bison at uh, Blue Mounds and then Miniopa, there was um, I had some livestock background, but um, as far as training on the job, no, there's, there was, there was none. There was uh, learn as you go, learn from staff that's at, that was at Blue Mounds previously, um, but then just uh, grab as many tidbits of information as you can from everybody around you, learn from experience, learn from this person, that person, and learn from, probably the most was learn from the bison themselves, what works, what doesn't work, because they're they're gonna tell you, then it's up to you to listen and you better listen. Uh, Ashley. I haven't had any formal training myself. A lot of it has just been working with the staff that have been working with the bison for a number of years. And 
um, learning from them. One thing that we do is I, I talked a little bit yesterday about how the bison don't respond like cattle do when we're handling them. So um, that hooping and hollering and, and heavy pressure, they don't respond to that. They'll lock down. And so one thing that we do before every management event is we do go through and, and have reminders for how to properly manage the bison through that corral system where we talk about remaining silent, staying out of sight, using flags and how to use those flags to move the bison and minimize the stress on them during that day. That is something that we do annually to keep it fresh in everyone's mind since it is only once a year. Um, in addition, Craig had talked about the book they referenced and Molly had talked about humane handling techniques. So a lot of that research was done ahead of time to make sure that we were doing the best thing we could for the bison. Mm -hmm. And I should note there's also, and you're probably not thinking of it because of the way I framed the question, but there are, is also safety training that you all took to be on the range and be out there. I know because I took it before I was allowed to go out there. That And some of that safety training is just knowing uh, bison signals, like what does it mean when their tail is in the air? What does it mean when their ears are down? Like what, you know, being able to know if you're in a potentially risky situation and then how you should respond because while it might be um tempting to think of them as pets they are not they they are wild and they they will do what they want to do i think gwen mentioned yesterday lucy one of the the female bison who definitely she's she's got a lot of personality <laughs> she's not somebody that you uh, you want to listen to what she's telling you. <laughs> so if she's getting ornery, you need to be taking a lot of steps back and recognizing that she is a, a lot bigger than you. Megan, uh, I like to watch yeah. the videos. Yeah. I like to watch the videos of people getting chased or gored at Yellowstone. And I'm, I'm serious here. You watch the videos, just YouTube it, the bison will give two or three warnings to that park visitor, letting them know that they are unhappy. And, and so it's a good, those videos are good to like see, okay, is the tail straight up? Is the tail partially up? You know, or what are they doing? So that it's a really good way to, to see bison behavior, what they're going to look like right before you get gored, you know? So <laughs> recognizing those signs and knowing just to leave them their space is probably the biggest thing. Yeah, absolutely. I know, Molly, you did a good job of telling me what those signs were before we went out and were investigating wetlands, uh, which is a, another aspect. We were talking earlier about balancing, you know, rare species, bison needs, prairie management, park visitors, all of the things, right? Uh, even something like, well, the bison need an additional watering source. Well, then we need to make sure that we're upholding all of our state laws and regulations as they're related to wetlands. And so is this a rare wetland that is protected under state law? You know, these are, everything is still at play. There's not like a special exemption because there's bison there. So we still have to consider all of these, these things. And so it's really nice to get to do that partner work and, and be out there together, you know, putting our heads together to make these decisions. What are we looking at? Is this, would this wetland make a good watering source? Is it ephemeral and it wouldn't? These are all things we had to kind of consider. Jess, do you want to ask your question about cool season invasives? And then I think we'll wrap with uh, these two questions about complexity and challenges and opportunities. Yeah, um, I remember you guys said something about the bison like to eat cool season invasives and smooth brome and Kentucky bluegrass are a huge issue in a lot of the uh, prairies, you know, tall grass and mixed grass prairies where I'm at. Um, was it an, was this like an issue on the site before the bison were introduced, something that you were concerned with? Um, and have you seen a decrease in these um, species since the bison have been out there? Um, we've got some data on, on cattle, and so I'm just kind of interested in on how bison affect those species. Yeah, so there was a lot out there, especially in that unit eight I showed that was um, partially farmed. And then there's a long grazing history out there uh, that unit eight was grazed. And so 
we had kind of just this big old brome and Kentucky bluegrass field in parts of it. And those are the parts they do like to graze repeatedly in. I would love to say that they've just completely reduced that, but the reality is it's like your lawn. Like they're just going in and, and mowing the lawn every once in a while, you know, even once a week. That Kentucky bluegrass is fine. It just grows right back. So I don't think they're actually like reducing it huge amounts but what i think is happening is there's more forbs able to come in into those little spaces um in those little bare ground and disturbance areas that are being created so um i don't have you know the full data on it yet but that's my what i think is happening is that they're not significantly reducing it but maybe allowing other things to express a little better perfect now we're going to wrap with a, a big, complicated question, and I'll just answer this really quick. What's the difference between a bison and a buffalo? The, um, there isn't. Uh, some people, like when I went to school for wildlife science, uh, some of my professors made a big deal about how there's no such thing as a North American buffalo because that is a species of water buffalo. If you're looking at the Latin name for it in um, other parts of the world, but really when you start unlearning some of the bad things that you were taught, you realize that from a native perspective, you know, buffalo, that's generally the term that they use. They're a sacred relative. And so we shouldn't be so mm, snobby about our Latin nomenclature, about what things are called. It, again, it's more about understanding what we're talking about in the moment. So their Latin name is bison, bison, or in some places, bison, bison, bison like depending on the subspecies so but like scott said and and others have said bison buffalo it doesn't matter how you refer to them so. i'll say that indigenous peoples had their own languages thank you multiple languages and and had their own names in their languages for the bison and in dakota Lakota, Nakota, it's Tatanka. Um, so Buffalo came from English. <laughs> I I heard a pretty funny uh, joke the other day, or I don't know if it was a joke, but um, maybe it was you, Gwen, who told me this. <laughs> Again, because the Dakota, this was their homeland before European settlers were here. Um, I think maybe it was Gwen that you said to me at the Minneopa Field Days that you know, the plants don't recognize when you're calling them by the Latin name because the name that they know is the Dakota name because, because that's their true origin of who, who first spoke to them. So it's just a way to, I mean, we're being a little bit silly, but it's also just a way to reframe how we maybe think about things. And we're so sometimes exact about how something needs to be or has to be. But really, if we take a step back, we realize there's a lot of, nuance in between there and there and things to learn so but when scott's in the audience i always say bison <laughs> <laughs> oh glenn you're the best okay we're gonna end with this question here and i know it's a big one to end with and i should have given us more time because we are gonna round robin it and then while they're answering this question, because we'll probably go just a little bit past 1130. So if you need to just cut and run right at 1130, we're going to put the what's next Padlet in there for how this training might have changed how you think about the management you're doing or the conservation endeavors you're engaged in. I think Becky's going to pop in our evaluation, which we would super appreciate if you would fill out so that we can get better at these trainings and make sure that they're relevant to you. And so then we will leave you with um, the answers to challenges and opportunities. I'm not going to read the question because I think all of our panelists can read them, but I am going to start with Scott. Just to throw him off. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks. Thanks, Megan. Just remember, I'm doing this on my own. <laughs> I know. Well, I also am starting with you because then you can just cut and run because you're retired. <laughs> so you I should have cut and run before. <laughs> um, I, you know, I'm not going to speak of the challenges just because I have, uh, in essence, removed myself uh, from this. Um, but I think there is a lot of uh, great opportunities and great partnerships 
Um, and I think just working with Dakota County, uh, the Minnewakan uh, tribe, uh, Oxbow uh, Zoo, or I, I can't remember, over by Byron. Um, and then, you know, um, Harmoral uh, Nature Center has expressed interest. I think there are just a lot of great opportunities uh, to bring bison uh, back onto this landscape and really show um, how cool prairie is. And hopefully that we, in essence, get much more prairie. That was beautiful. Uh, Molly, let's go to you. Then we're going to go Craig, Ashley, Gwen, just in case. I already forgot the that. question. It, it was the <laughs> what are the challenges? <laughs> yeah, well, focus maybe on opportunities. Like, OK, um, so it's a, it was both like, what do you see as the greatest challenge moving forward? Okay. And what opportunities are you most excited for in the future? And this one was kind of the same where it said, has it been worth it? You know, sure. and what would you do differently? So a hundred, I'm one hundred and ten percent. It's been worth it. It's been probably the most rewarding project of my career. Um, don't let all the things you have to do to get bison on your site hold you back. Like it seems intimidating when you like, oh, we, you know, the fencing and it's going to cost so much. It's worth it um, if you do it right. And right now, I'd say now that we're really established at Minneop, our biggest challenge is. We have all these genetically rare babies being born every spring and we have no place for them to go because we can't increase our herd size. So that's like a challenge is, you know, what do we do with these animals in that they can have a meaningful contribution? Um, and so that's where we're working with the partnerships. But it's it's been really fun to work with the partners as well. So. Great. Um, we've talked about quite a few of the challenges, but as far as opportunities, um, so I'm originally from in up until my mid 20s was in extreme southeast Minnesota. So bluff country, fully wooded uh, valley streams, um, moved out to this area. And when I took the job at Blue Mounds, um, after the my work the work day was done. I would grab a park UTV and drive out into the bison range. And you needed some protection. So you were in a UTV, but you could drive literally right into the middle of the herd, shut the engine off and just listen. There was no vehicle traffic. There was no people sounds. It was just bison grunting, grazing, metal larks, and you could just take it all in. And for me, that was my that was when I made a connection with prairie, I would say, as opposed to just wooded country. And with the bison buggy that's at Blue Mounds now, with all the people that are coming to Miniopa, um, there's that opportunity to make that connection, that exact same connection for people. And um, I think we're doing a good job of that, and I hope that we can continue to do that. Ashley, it's all you. Craig really hit on one of my big opportunities, and it's really that ability to connect people with nature. I mean, just having state parks is wonderful, and people visit them and, and cherish them throughout the state. But there's a reason Miniopa became so popular once the bison were introduced. It's something that excites people. It brings people to the parks that otherwise wouldn't have come here. And once they visit, it opens them to visiting other parks or coming back to Miniopa and creating those connections with the bison and nature and prairies and just everything it has to offer. One of the other opportunities that I really see is strengthening our connections with the tribal members within our area. One thing that we did last year is we invited tribal members to come to our management event and watch us throughout the event and how we were handling those bison. And one of the things that I felt extremely good about is afterwards, I went and I spoke with some of them and asked them, how do you think we did? How do you feel about the way we're, we're handling them? And I received really good feedback. And that really makes me feel good to know that they see how hard we're trying to connect and to manage their relatives and bring them into our hearts as well. 
And that's really rewarding for me. When, when it's the last it's the word. word. I think the most exciting thing for the future from my perspective is that there will be generations now who say, yes, I know what the prairie looks like and I know what it's like to see bison on the prairie and how important they are to the landscape. So that's restoration, regeneration, um, and perpetuation into the future. And that's what I'm most excited about. Beautiful. Well, did amazing. We, we're done with our two day virtual field day. We'll hang out for a little bit here in case people have a burning question that um, didn't get answered. Uh, if you would, I typed into the chat a what's next, and it's just a fun way for us to capture what you might have learned today. Of course, we also put the standard evaluation link into the chat as well that we hope that you will um, take that evaluation, tell us how we're doing, tell us things that we could have improved upon here. We're still exploring this whole virtual field day world, and so we, <laughs> we have a lot to learn. <laughs> so that's it, we have a lot to learn. Um, that would be much appreciated if you could do both of those. And so I already love this, um, the Missouri Department of Conservation um, comments in here. Well, the person with, anyway, this comment right here. <laughs> I was trying to read the comment and talk. You see how hard this is. So just thank you for your time. And we'll just hang out, like I said, for about five or so minutes just to see if anybody's got another question. Elizabeth does. So I am going to, these are bonus time questions, so I'm just going to stop this little recording. Uh, Molly mentioned trying to find other herds to trade calves. How do different, oh wait, before I read this question, <laughs> it's like I've never hosted a field day before. Thank you all, to all the participants for spending time with us. Uh, I know it's always kind of strange in this virtual format, so I hope it was easy for you. I hope you got to eat snacks. I hope you learned something. And so don't be afraid to, as Gwen said, ask questions, listen, it's a hard one, but you got to do it. Listen and learn from each other. That's the way we make this world and our, our prairie endeavors better. Okay, now I'm going to ask you this question. <laughs> Amanda, you did a great job. Okay, so Elizabeth Molly mentioned trying to find other herds to trade calves. How do different herd managers stay in touch with each other across the state? Um, so once a year we have a meeting, uh, it's usually held at the Minnesota Zoo. Um, this year it's actually going to be online, but we call it our Bison Day. And so all of our partners from, you know, Dakota County Parks, Minnesota Zoo, DNR, um, our tribal partners, everyone's invited to that. And then we discuss the management for the year. And we also use it as an opportunity to do some learning. Um, sometimes we bring in speakers like the uh, researcher Dr. James Durr, who has mapped the bison genome, he came one year and spoke for our group. And so that's like our biggest way we once a year all connect and see each other and touch base and talk about, you know, how the year went. And then we also have kind of logistics meetings and when we're going to say, okay, we're going to move this animal here and that animal and it's going to use the zoo trailer and move on this day. So um, so we're also partnering with them. And then, you know, as also mentioned, we invite our partners to our management days on site. So everyone's seeing each other there. And but but we've done a lot of communication prior to that to know what's going on in that day. So that's kind of how we um, stay in touch. And then for new partners, um, I kind of have a traveling road show where I go out and tell people about our conservation herd and try to get them excited about it. So um, I go out and speak to partners a lot about that too. And then Elizabeth also asked, are you willing to share that meeting link for us to pass on? Yeah, um, if she wants to send me an email, if people would like an invite, we can do that, yep. We, we've just changed the date, so. <laughs> I'm gonna put everybody's email in here. 
Um, I think that's the last of the questions. Craig, are you just Craig Dot Beckman? He's nodding his head. Yes. Okay. Um, all the state people are the same. It's just our first, first and last name um, at state.mn.us. And email only, we're the same. Am I getting everyone? And then I'm going to type Gwen's in here too, just to make sure we get Gwen's. I'm keeping the recording running just while I. Um, Gwen, do you want me to put your Minnesota State or your own website in here? Which would you like? Put the MSU. Um, yeah. Those who didn't realize it, Gwen's kind of a big deal. Oh, so so she's, <laughs> she's got her own website and she's also got this Minnesota State Mankato. Okay. All right. All right.